meaning is white out to get rid of that. Um, I did use this once when I taught at Slippery Rock and I taught general biology. <laughs> and I had it as a take home quiz, you know? And I had so many people crying whenever <laughs> I came back. And I thought, I will never, ever make that as a take home quiz again. I didn't mean for it to be so frustrating for people, but they were like, I don't understand, I don't know, I'm gonna give it zero. Okay. okay. Granted, now we have Khan Academy, so you really can, you could have answered the question pretty easily, but anyway, let's see. So number one, uh, step one, glycolysis. This is what we just went over, what's showing behind me. Now, glycolysis. We didn't really talk about this, but where does glycolysis occur, do you think? For the clues on the diagram. It's the blood. Closer. You're getting warmer. So I don't know what I'm going to call it. It's a diagram. <coughs> So, so remember when we absorb glucose uh, from the digestive tract into the capillaries, okay? The glucose travels to the cells um, and the glucose will be transported into the cell. And as soon as that glucose gets into the cell cytoplasm, it's trapped by the phosphate from ATP. Okay, so that's where it occurs. Glycolysis occurs in the cell cytoplasm. Glycolysis begins when a six carbon molecule called what enters the process? What did you say? I missed it once and then I'll never hear it again. What, what, what molecule is it? Yes, glucose, very good. Thank God you know that because I mean, that's the whole point. The whole point is to break down glucose, right? So glucose enters the process. It is broken down into two, three carbon molecules, ultimately broken down into two, three carbon molecules of what? Pyruvic acid. Pyruvic acid, right, that's the goal. And two NAD are what? To, to form two NADH plus H molecules. Okay, I'll give you a, two, a choice. Reduced or oxidized? Reduced. Or reduced, very good. Reduced because it gains electrons, right? It goes from NAD to NADH plus H. It gains hydrogen, it gains electrons. NADH plus H, okay, we see the hydrogens there, it also carries electrons, right, which is the whole reason we use the term reduced. And then two net molecules are created per one molecule of glucose via, or by way of, a phosphorylation reaction. What are the high energy molecules? ATP, very good. And so if you learn that, and you learn what I wrote on the board up here, then you should be okay to answer questions that I would ask you about this process of glycolysis. Yes? Yeah, two net ATP molecules are created per one molecule of glucose via a phosphorylation reaction. Good. Okay, now we can put this away for a little bit and we can um, go into the next
process, which is all about fermentation, lactic acid fermentation. Okay, so why did I say put this away, put this handout away for right now? Because what we're gonna be talking about next happens whenever we don't have adequate supplies of oxygen. Okay, so in an anaerobic situation, the lactic acid pathway will occur. Okay, so fermentation will occur. That's what we call the fermentation pathway. After we get through this, then we're gonna talk about what happens when oxygen is available, and then we'll go back to this, because this is all an outline of cellular respiration which again, cellular respiration requires that oxygen comes into the cell and the cell produces and respires carbon dioxide from itself. Okay, so we can put this hand out away for now. All right, so what happens to pyruvic acid if we don't have enough oxygen available? So basically in order to avoid end product inhibition, which we talked a little bit about, but NADHs that are produced in glycolysis have to give their hydrogen molecules away. In other words, if we didn't do this, what would happen is, is that glucose metabolism would completely stop because our coenzymes would end up being saturated and they wouldn't have any place to give their hydrogens to, okay? And we're going to see where the hydrogens come in handy in the process of cellular respiration when we get to that aerobic part of this. So, um, so here's what happens. Pyruvic acid, which is a three carbon molecule, okay, you can see that. What happens is pyruvic acid, and how many pyruvic acid do we produce? Two. Actually, two is like your go-to number for a lot of this. <laughs> a lot of this is two. Two, 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 you'll see that. So we produce two pyruvic acid molecules in glycolysis, so that, therefore we're gonna actually go through this particular process twice. I should move this out of the way. I just realized I might be obstructing the view. You guys feel comfortable telling me if you can't see because my bags are in the way, right? Or no? You would tell me, right? Tell me, <laughs> you can tell me. I, I just realized now, if you guys are having trouble seeing, let me know. I'm sorry, I just, I didn't think about that. All right, so anyway, um, so we have two pyruvic acid molecules produced. So this reaction will occur twice per glucose molecule, right? Because with one glucose, we produce two pyruvic acids, okay. So here's what happens. We have to give, the pyruvic acid gives up its high, it, it's going to, um, sorry, it's, it's going to gain two hydrogens, all right, to become lactic acid. Notice the blue hydrogens here. They now are attached to the pyruvic acid molecule and it becomes lactic acid, okay? So, what has happened to pyruvic acid when it became <coughs> lactic acid? Was it oxidized or reduced? Oxidized. Well, what happened to, to, to pyruvic acid to become lactic acid? Did it gain or lose elect or gain or lose hydrogens? Gained. Gained. So it is reduced. reduced. Pyruvic acid here is reduced to lactic acid, but as we know, oxidation reactions are coupled to reduction reactions. Everything that gains something, for everything that gains something has to lose. So what loses in this case is NADH plus H. It's going to lose its hydrogens and become NAD again so that saturation of NAD doesn't occur. And the hydrogens that are lost are going to be gained by pyruvic acid to become lactic acid. So we said that pyruvic acid has been, has been reduced to lactic acid. The NADH plus H is gonna be what to become NAD? Oxidized or reduced? Reduced. Oxidized, Oxidized right? <laughs> right, so py since pyruvic acid's reduced, NADH plus H is oxidized. So redox, right? The, the NADH plus H lost its hydrogens, pyruvic acid gained them. So everything that loses, something has to gain. Any questions?
questions? All right, so we had two pyruvic acid molecules that were produced through glycolysis for that glucose molecule. We're gonna have two NAD molecules that are produced and two lactic acid molecules that are produced because this reaction occurs twice. Because we produce two pyruvic acids back here, right? Through glycolysis, one glucose molecule, two pyruvic acids. So therefore, this reaction has to happen twice. So pyruvic to lactic is an oxidized reaction. Reduction. I'm so confused. I said that the first time and I thought I was wrong. And then, so which part was oxidized? The NADH plus H. Ger, Leo, Ger. Lose electrons, oxidation, gain electrons, and reduction. When NADH plus H becomes NAD, it loses electrons. I'm misunderstanding the diagram. Oxidized. What, what, what don't you know? Uh, it looks like an interpretation of the same information. You know what I mean? It looks like it's all one thing, broken down two separate ways. I don't understand. I don't either. <laughs> follow the blue hydrogens. It's like follow the dots, the bouncing ball. Like when you remember, like MTV, if you're trying to sing, <laughs> follow the blue hydrogens. NADH plus H has them, but they it gives it away, right? Okay. Where does it give it to? It gives it to pyruvic acid over here. And then pyruvic acid is now lactic acid, gained the hydrogens, so it's reduced. Gains electrons, gains hydrogens, it's reduced. What's oxidized is NADH plus H to form NAD. Okay, where I was confused was I thought that NAD at the top with the little pink arrow was part of lactic acid. I thought it was, tell I thought it was two separate ways to break down the same thing. No, uh, no. No, but all. I get it now. One goes becomes NAD and the other becomes lactic acid. Yeah, NAD through the process it's, it's of thing. reduction yeah. and oxidation. Right. Can you just taught me something. Oh my gosh. Thanks. That's the first thing all semester I know. I just taught him something. And everybody's like, well, I had this before. That's how I know. It's like, thanks. <laughs> it's like, I've done nothing. I've accomplished nothing. I've taught you nothing. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. In time, maybe. Maybe it'll all settle the dust. Okay, so we only yield... Okay, so, like, if we have an anaerobic situation, it's not very efficient. Because for us, all we're going to be doing is producing two ATP in glycolysis. We don't produce any ATP through the lactic acid pathway, right? We don't produce anything here. All we produce is what we produced in glycolysis, which is just the net of two. So it's not very efficient, which is why humans actually become very tired once you start to get like, you know, lactic acid fermentation buildup and stuff, your muscles get really fatigued. And that's the reason why. Now, some other organisms, like, for example, yeast cells, they can generate ATP very efficiently anaerobically. And yeasts we can use to make what? Beer. Beer. So what do you do? You put in some hops and barley into some water and you throw the yeast in there. What's hops and barley? Glucose, right? You close it off in a vat. Ultimately, the oxygen runs out and the yeast have to go through fermentation. And they can live like that. They, they can, again, they can go through this very quickly. They're very efficient. But instead of generating lactic acid, they produce what? Not beer, but what's in the beer? Alcohol. They produce alcohol? beer. Yeast. Ethanol, alcohol. Ethanol. Yeah, alcohol, right, exactly. Here's something interesting, huh? Well, you guys, some, what'd you say? Exactly. See, it all goes together. In a regular semester, it's nice because usually we get to this point around St. Patrick's Day, so it's like perfect topic. And some of you guys I already told you this, um, but some of you guys haven't heard this before. But there was a story 
There was a story in the news about two or three years ago about this woman who got pulled over for drunk driving. Did you read that? <laughs> it's a joke because I mean, there was a story about that every day. But no, there was a woman who got <laughs> pulled over for drunk driving, but here's the problem. She didn't have any alcohol at her meal, but she did have pasta. She didn't know she was drunk. The breathalyzer shows that she was definitely drunk. Well, this is a problem probably many of you wish you had. But this woman had yeast that had colonized in her esophagus. And whenever she ate the pasta, the yeast generated ethanol. And she was drunk. The judge ruled, the judge ruled, that she was not going to be punished for driving that way because she didn't know she had a problem. But if she ever drove again after eating a meal like that, and, then, and she was pulled over for drunk driving, then she would be punished for it. But isn't that the craziest thing that you ever heard? And it was a, it was reputable. I read it in like the New York Times or something. I mean, it was a reputable source. It How does something like that happen? Huh? The yeast in her, how does that happen? I don't know. I mean, there is, you know, some people, you can have like, uh, I mean, I don't know that this is what she had, but you can have things like thrush, which is basically candida albicans, which is a brewer's yeast that colonizes on the back of your tongue, like up the part that right before it goes down, you know. Um, people people have that issue usually if they're immunocompromised like somebody had HIV or something that was one of the things that could happen but other immunocompromised individuals also could have that issue but I don't know that she was immunocompromised I'm not really sure how it happened but she said there like an actual like Again, it's not really favored in the body because it's just not that efficient, only yielding a net of two ATP for us. However, some of our cells that do not contain mitochondria, like red blood cells, for example, rely on the lactic acid pathway for their for their for their ATP production. And it's interesting because um, red blood cells, when you think of it, they really don't need to generate a lot of energy because they, I mean they're just like riding down the lazy river of you know your circulatory system I mean the heart propels them moves them forward they don't really need to have much energy right they just they just you know float around kind of on, on you know like I said the lazy river of your body so they don't need it um, but they you know they don't have mitochondria and only use the lactic acid pathway. Now we're gonna see where the mitochondria are so important. We've always said that the mitochondria generate this large amount of ATP. Well today, or not today, but on Thursday, we're gonna find out why when we talk about, um, when we actually talk about um, the electron transport chain and also the Krebs cycle, which both occur in the mitochondria. <clears throat> so in skeletal and heart muscle, fermentation happens whenever oxygen uh, supply falls below a critical level. So again, you get a burning sensation in your skeletal muscles when you're doing activities that you can't sustain. However, if you're having a heart attack because you have an occlusion in your blood vessels, a lot of times people feel pain 
that radiates to the shoulder and so forth, that's because of the lactic acid that, that is generated because they have no way of producing ATP aerobically. And likewise, people who have angina, which is, I guess you could say if you're lucky enough to have angina, at least you know that your blood vessels are occluded. A lot of times people just have a sudden heart attack and they don't even realize it. But uh, basically, if you have angina, uh, you, can you, can, you can generate the chest pain with exercise and sometimes if it's really severe, 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 even without exercise. So that's like an unstable angina. But basically you have blood flow occlusion and you can't get enough oxygen to the muscle. And because you can't get enough oxygen to the cardiac muscle, you get lactic acid that builds up and that's why you generate the pain. So um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's a lactic acid. Hmm? You got it? Yeah. What is it? Auto brewery syndrome. Auto brewery syndrome? Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So you but have it does have to do with the. Um, like a thrush. Thrush. Not you having it. So she said it's auto brewery syndrome and it's most likely to occur in like a crush situation or well, Crohn's disease, which would make sense, although so it's just one of the pathogens that causes it. Which is Crohn's. Yeah, that, that could make sense. That makes sense because your intestinal flora is gonna be disrupted if you have um, a situation like Crohn's for sure, in the digestive tract. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Thank you very much for looking that up. They say that it's like really rare for it to like actually cause you to be drunk. Hmm. Well, she was one of the lucky ones. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> that is not lucky. I mean, seriously, like you can't, like you couldn't, what could you do? Like you really can't eat carbohydrate. What could she, she yeah, probably so only like high protein, protein and low carbs. Yeah, like steak, exactly. She could like eat steak or chicken, but that's about it. Like forget the potatoes, forget the bread, forget salads even because that's carbohydrate. That's the glucose is in the, in the leaves. But it's like antifungal therapy. It's a treatment for it. Really? That's crazy. Antifungal? Yeah. Antibiotics, carbohydrate, control, and antifungal therapy. I'm surprised fungal. Okay, well, thank you for that. I do appreciate it. I learned something today, too. It's what I got up for, <laughs> so I could learn something today. I, no, seriously, I mean, that's the one thing. I always wake up in the morning and I think to myself, I wonder what I'm gonna learn today. Because <laughs> you just don't know what's gonna happen and you don't know what situation you'll be in or what, I mean, you always learn something new every day from people <laughs> or, you know, just, looking at things. Um, okay, so I want to get into now some of the gluco and glyco words that we were going to, I told you, talk about. This is, I think, probably one of the more, let me see. Actually, I'm going to skip that slide for a second and go to this. I'll go back to the previous one in a minute. But the, this is a great kind of glossary for this chapter. Um, with some of these confusing words. Like, okay, we just talked about glycolysis. So we know that this is the breakdown of glucose inside the cell, cytoplasm. Now, there are two other terms we're gonna talk about right now, glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. Now, in this case, we're talking about glycogen. Okay, so there's glycogenesis which means to generate or to produce glycogen. And then there's, of course, our lysis ending. And glycogenolysis is to break down glycogen. So what's a situation where you would build glyco, uh, glycogen and glycogenesis? Why would we build glycogen? 
what situation, what physiological circumstance would we have to want to, to have to build glycogen? First of all, where is glycogen stored? Where? It is stored in skeletal muscle. There's two places, skeletal muscle and the liver. Very good. So why would we need to build glycogen? Because what, what's going on in the blood? Don't all shout at once. I know you're excited. You're excited to tell me, but I can't hear you over all this loudness. You, you guys? Could you like bodybuilding? No, not bodybuilding. That would actually produce the opposite <laughs> effect. Um, no, glycogenesis would occur if your blood sugar is too high. You, you need to take the, the glucose out of the bloodstream and store it as glycogen in the liver or in skeletal muscle. Glycogenolysis is going to occur when you want to break down glycogen, release it from the liver. That would occur where blood sugar levels are too what? Low. Too low, exactly. So that's what those are about. Then there's another process called gluco neogenesis. This is a really uh, cool thing actually. Um, this shows how the body can, can basically build up what it needs to. Uh, it can use what it has to, but it can also break things down. So gluco of course means glucose. Neo is new. Genesis is generation of. So gluconeogenesis is a process by which new glucose can be created from something that wasn't glucose. And we're going to talk about how lactic acid can actually be converted to glucose, fresh glucose, believe it or not. It's kind of an interesting idea, um, but it does happen. And then, of course, we have some lipo words. Lipogenesis means to make uh, triglycerides, lipogenolysis to break it down, and ketogenesis to make ketone bodies. But first of all, let's talk about glycogenesis and glycogenolysis. So the liver stores glucose as glycogen, also skeletal muscle can do that. Um, and of course, both of these organs are going to create uh, glycogen. They string long chains of glucose together through a series of dehydration reactions. We produce this long uh, molecule. Skeletal muscle also has uh, glycogen, but skeletal muscle can't release can't release glucose into the bloodstream. It uses the glycogen um, and the glucose attached uh, for its own energy needs. It's a very quick form of energy. And glycogenolysis is a process by which we break down uh, the glycogen um, into glucose. So the liver contains an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphatase. If you remember back in chapter four, when we introduced enzymes, we mentioned the naming of enzymes and how phosphatase enzymes in general remove phosphates and kinase enzymes add phosphates. I don't know if you recall this or not, but it's in chapter four when we were talking, the slide where we were talking about naming of enzymes. So the rest of the name, glucose 6, refers to the molecule that this enzyme removes the phosphate from. And specifically, it's our glucose 6 molecule that we produced in glycolysis with our first ATP molecule. <coughs> Remember, we had um, our, first, our first product that we produced in that metabolic pathway is glucose 6 phosphate. We have a phosphate from our ATP that generates so we have our phosphate, right? We have our ATP it becomes ADP and phosphate. Right? And that phosphate goes over here. So we have our ATP becoming ADP, 
and the phosphate that's released is used to phosphorylate this molecule to make glucose 6 phosphate. Remember, before the break, we talked about that. You with me? Okay. So glucose 6 phosphatase is only found in the liver, and that is the reason why the liver is the only organ, not skeletal muscle, but just the liver can release free glucose back into the bloodstream because it has this enzyme. And that means that it can remove the phosphate off of the sixth carbon, and now the glucose transporters will work again because the molecule is shaped appropriately. Okay. So the last thing we'll discuss today is this diagram. Um, this is showing us basically either the liver or skeletal muscle cells, uh, whichever. Um, we have glucose in the bloodstream coming into the cell. And as soon as we get in there, as we said before, our phosphate is added to the glucose to make glucose 6-phosphate. Now, if the cell doesn't need to make energy, okay, which it can make energy if it goes in this process through, you know, glycolysis like we just described. If we don't need to make energy, then the glucose 6-phosphate will be converted to glucose 1-phosphate. And that phosphate will be removed so that the glucose molecule can be added to the long chain of glycogen. So number one illustrates which process? The process of glycogenesis or the process of glycogenolysis? Number one. Like I said, you guys are just too rowdy for me. You got two choices, pick one. The first one. Which was? <laughs> Yes, glycogenesis, right? You're generating glycogen from this glucose molecule. Okay, then um, if we need, if we're talking about the liver, if we need to release glucose into the blood or if the liver or skeletal muscle needs the glucose for its own energy needs, then the glycogen will release a glucose, the phosphate's added to it, produce glucose 1-phosphate, then glucose 6-phosphate, and then we can go through glycolysis. Or if it's the liver and the blood sugar is low, then the glucose 6-phosphate is going to be acted on by glucose 6-phosphatase. That phosphate's removed and the glucose can be released into the blood. So number two illustrates what process, glycogenesis or glycogenolysis? Glycogenolysis. Nice job. Do you have any questions? Yeah. What? So basically, um, number one takes off the phosphate off the liver. Takes off the phosphate so the glucose can be added to the chain of glycogen, right? And then the reverse happens with number two. We add the phosphate back. And then um, it's released from the glycogen, the glucose is released from the glycogen, and then we generate this, and then that, and then we can go through glycolysis. Or if it's the liver and the blood sugar level's low, then this glucose is phosphate, you have glucose 6-phosphatase that can take the phosphate off, and the glucose can be released into the bloodstream. Any other questions? Okay, I'll see you guys on Thursday. Remember, we have a quiz Thursday. <coughs> Is that your question, Maggie? Mm -hmm. We have a quiz Thursday, and it's going to cover everything that we talked about last week, which isn't a whole lot because we um, had the exam on Tuesday. We didn't talk about much, but it will be chapter... Okay, so we, we basically picked up with... Um, with the DNA uh, replication. Before that, we talked a little bit about uh, production of a protein on a ribosome that's on the rough ER. And then we talked about chapter four. Pretty much all of chapter four 
through uh, endergonic and exergonic reactions. This slide was the last slide that we covered. So it'll pretty much, we'll just say, let's just start with DNA replication, which there probably will maybe be one question about, and then all of chapter four uh, to this slide. Because today we picked up with um, oxidation and reduction. Okay. Anything else? You're free. Some of you just for a half hour, but 